Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbin. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Taylor, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, Taylor, it's going to be fun. We've got uh, my co-host, Randall Reeves, with me. And uh, for those that don't know Randall, Randall, what you did a figure eight basically around the planet, right, Randall? You went uh, (laughs) down the West Coast, around the other way around Antarctica, back around the East Coast of uh, Northern and Southern American continents, and then over the, the Northern Passage across Canada and back down. That That's what, um, Taylor, that, that's what Randall did. And I thought he'd be a perfect co-host with me because you guys can talk sailing in a way that I never could. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Cool. We've actually, yeah, that's where we know each other, man. We've emailed before. Oh, uh, like oh. four years ago, but. Oh, excellent. Oh, this before, this was before your passage? Yeah, before we made it around and before, uh, whenever you completed the figure eight. Yeah, the guy, uh, Steve Harris, put us in touch together. Oh, He's sailing yeah. out of California. Yeah, yeah, but very good, very good. We followed you pretty close, man. It's cool. I know you're gonna be on this. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, congratulations on what you've done. I mean, it's it's uh, very few people uh, have actually made it around Cape Horn in private yachts. So, well done, you. Well, well done, you, sir. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> compared to what you did. So oh, let's man. let's tell everybody, Taylor, what you've done, and then we'll get into the movie and everything else about it. But. Let's tell them about the sailing part of the adventure. And then let's talk sailing between you guys for a couple of minutes, because I think we don't understand just how hard it is to sail around something like any of the capes. I mean, even Cape Hatteras is probably dangerous on the wrong day. So let's talk a little bit about what you did and go from there. All right, Pete. Uh, first off, do you understand what you got into putting two sailors on your podcast? <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure you <laughs> We're he may not. not he, he, he might not be able to ask any questions uh, uh, at all, <laughs> which is it's it's okay because he's wearing the wrong baseball cap anyway. I mean, it's like it's just wrong, man. It's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> not cool. even champions anymore. Yeah, I don't have a Giants cap. My Giants cap is all old and worn out, and I threw it out. I got to get a new one. You do, but I won't say that again. All right, um, Taylor. Yeah, so I got out of the Navy at the end of 2016, and. I bought a boat in 2017 in February, and then I set sail um, from Florida for Cape Horn in September 2017. From where? And from Florida. Florida. Yeah, went through the Panama Canal and then down the west side, which you're familiar with. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. And it took us two years. So we had a – it was not – easy and our boat was a real piece of shit too but <laughs> <laughs> everything that could go wrong went wrong on that trip i'm sure you can what, what, that. what was the boat what was the boat it was a watkins 36 uh-huh yeah 1983 one of the things jerome rand another sailor who's been on the show and has done solo uh circumnavigation one of the things uh, we talked about with randall on his episode was how customized these boats have to be to withstand these long things where like you make a mast, you take it to the folks that make masks and you're like, these are the dimensions I need. Now, like your bananas, that doesn't go on the boat. You know, it's the wrong kind of thing. But as you said, if you've got a piece of shit or if you don't have a customized boat, you're taking on greater risk. Is that fair to say? Yeah, we didn't do any of that, man. There was none of that. <laughs> we had a lot of holes in the boat. She was held together by duct tape for sure. <laughs> what do you think about that, Randall? Hey, yeah, uh, more power to you. You know, every adventurer chooses his poison. You might say, um, a, a, a passage around Cape Horn is going to be challenging any way you slice it. And uh, so, you know, it, you, you you decide how to handle risk on your own. Uh, I I did things a little differently, but then I I you know it was a different kind of project. So, yeah, he, yeah, you went the long haul, dude. You went all the way around <laughs> Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we could not have done that. We couldn't have done that in the old lady. No way. And you can't even well, legally was... go. You can't even legally go across Canada right now, too, right, Randall? Like that's all closed off right now. 
Uh, it, it may still be closed. It was closed during COVID for sure. I, I think some of the borders between the states and Canada have opened. I actually don't know if the waterway has opened. Um, their, their rationale for closing the Arctic was that there are a lot of uh, indigenous communities up there that would really struggle if they were to get infected. Um, so uh, that was the reason. And I, that may not be an issue now. I just really don't know. But yeah, you know, part of the reason that I, I spent a lot of time working on getting a boat, a specific boat, was, you know, to your point, uh, a full lap of the Arctic is, is no joke. And as it turned out, that was, uh, on, from the boat's perspective, that was kind of the easy part. The, the Arctic and the ice turned out to be really challenging. But, uh, but you know, I mean, the boats we have today are, uh, it, it, pretty much any of them are f- far and away stronger than anything that the so those first guys were using uh to get around the cape you know in in, in the early 1900s so yeah. uh, but tell us more of your story i don't know anything about your story i'd like to know uh you know you said it took two years where did you haul in uh, ah. when, did you, when did you make it around cape horn Pete just threw you in this huh yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so we were on a shoestring kind of budget. So we had a, we stopped and worked a lot of places. Like the only reason we were able to afford going through the Panama Canal is we were there for about two and a half months and we were working as linemen, working on other people's boats, mm-hmm. um, being a lineman when they were going through the canal. And then um, our transmission shattered on us on the way from Panama to Ecuador. So we pulled in Ecuador. We ended up being in Ecuador for about three months mm-hmm. and we just did odd jobs there working for food. <laughs> and uh, by the time I got the engine, and transmission rebuilt there we set sail for uh for chile pulled into valparaiso we skipped peru i don't know i don't know how many landfalls you actually made it was only a couple right so i don't think you uh none none down there uh, at yeah. least on the second attempt none down there so you're, Ooh, you're man. you got you got to actually cruise so good on you we did cruise yeah um but the the customs dealing with customs down there is crazy it's a whole other yeah. beast um that set us back every time we pulled in so we skipped peru for that purpose yep and went straight to chile when we left Valparaiso, we went to Valdivia, which was awesome. And uh, and at, and on this whole leg, we, this is when we uh, wrapped it up with Steve Harris, the guy that, that put us on to you. And we followed you the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, then once we set sail from Valdivia, it was all the way to Cape Horn with Patagonia, which was, I'm sure, like you saw, just that's the most beautiful place I've ever seen. I don't know how close yeah. you got to it. but Well, during the first attempt, the, the one I didn't actually succeed on, I, uh, I cracked up off Cape Horn and had to hand steer for a week into Ushuaia uh, in Argentina. And, and you know, it, it's not great to, to have to make an emergency landfall, but boy, what an awesome place to make an emergency landfall. Ushuaia, Argentina, Chile, just at, to your point, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, that channel there, the Beagle Channel's crazy. It, yeah. Did you have good winds when you were going down the channel to Ushuaia? I had uh, no wind at all for like half of it. And then for half of it, I had wind straight up channel. So I had the motor the, the whole way. And I'd been hand steering for a week. So I was like just blisteringly tired. My boat is fairly big and fairly heavy. It's a tiller steered boat. But the tiller is only like, you know, three feet long. And uh, doing 18, 20 hour uh, tricks at the tiller to get in off the Southern Ocean was really challenging. Yeah. But I so I I had doing doing this for a week, right? You know, steer 18, 20 hours a day. Wow. Uh, but and so I was wiped out by the time I got into the Beagle Channel. But that's like coming into Explorer's Museum. That is just that's hollowed ground. And it's just crazy beautiful. Uh, yeah. It's like the yeah. orchestra starts singing when you pull into the channel. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Come in from out there. For well, real. and you think of uh, you know, all of those explorers who we've been reading about since we were right. kids, you know, Darwin and Leroy yeah. and, uh, have been down and through there. Everybody had to go around Cape Horn somehow, either right. around the Horn itself or through the channel. So it's just really neat to be able to be there. I don't know if I'll ever get back there. I would never have been there once if it hadn't been for a big screw up off Cape Horn. Do you Man. think about guys like Shackleton who uh, had to get off their ship and figure out how to survive along the way? Like, do you worry about that at all, Taylor? Nah, not really. I was pretty good. We And we had those talks, and John was with me. Um, I mean, we went through seer school, so surviving in the woods isn't very hard. Yeah. And then, I mean, I grew up in the sticks in Texas, so hunting and living off the land. And, dude, I mean, it's it's the most 
bountiful land in the world. It's untouched. I mean, there's animals and fish. We were filling up our water tanks off of the melting glaciers, spraying yeah. fresh water, yeah. mussels. The only thing you have to worry about is red tide down there. So as long as you're not in where the red tide is, you can, you can be, you're like living in a candy store down there. There's so much yeah. food. Yeah. So getting wrecked and living, I was like, we'll just have to live down here until somebody can buy this. <laughs> So well, you, we I want to yeah, ask we you about danger too, because yeah. one of the things Randall talked about in his sale is that sometimes in the middle of the night when you got to go fix something, you can't just tie off the entire time. And, you know, look, we're both military guys. I've done a lot of time in combat and there's times where I do things because I know the danger involved and I understand the risk. And so I'll extend myself out in a place where this is how you have to do it. You know, you have to expose yourself to some risk. And Randall had the same kind of thing. He was like, I can't tie off here because by the time I do all these things, and I don't want to speak for Randall, but there's a certain amount of risk that you have to accept. And sometimes you have to go away from the book. Did you have any experiences like that where you had to kind of, you know, go, I know what I'm supposed to do, but here's what we're going to do. Yeah. Uh, um, all the time, man. Um, so we're screening the documentary quite a bit now, right? We've done a couple of these and every time I swear, every screen we've done, somebody in the crowd says, you guys weren't wearing harnesses. You guys yeah. were wearing life jackets. It was like, if we would have taken the time to put a harness on, we would have lost the sale right then. So it's like, I'm either putting a harness in or I'm getting up to the front and untangling the sale. So yeah. there was a lot of, yeah, a lot of that. Um, and I think that's all sailing is, man. So now I teach a lot. I teach people how to sail a lot. And I get a lot of pilots that come sail. And it's funny when we have these conversations because it's all just managing risk. It's like, you can do it, dude, but how much risk do you want to take? And it is it better than than... The negative side of it so i mean we have that's a constant conversation sailing especially with crew all the time I mean, every day we have that there were two of you aboard there's three yeah so okay. um from well from florida to ecuador it was just steven and i there's just two um and we don't we didn't have autopilot that's why it's funny hearing you talk about hand steering because i understand um we didn't have autopilot or a wind vane or anything until we got to ecuador mm -hmm. and it was just steven and i hand steering the whole way down there um but dude, she was really good at balancing the sails. Like she would balance really well. Um, if the winds were the from the same direction and so was the swell, we could balance the sails. The longest time was about thirty six hours. We didn't have to push oh. the helm. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, once we passed Columbia and got past Humboldt. Dude, it was it was pretty cool. It was pretty consistent. So yeah, as long as we had consistent winds, we could balance really easy. Uh huh. Um, and then when we got to Ecuador, John, he was a rescue swimmer with me. And uh, he flew out, and then it was just John, Steve, and I for the rest of the trip. Randall, will you talk a little bit about that managing of risk? Because you did this solo. Like when, when we were talking, you were talking about how you sort of had a fail safe in case you did fall off. I mean, these guys, they're adorable. They had three dudes. They're going to be fine. You know? <laughs> it's well, so easy. I, uh, I'm with Taylor. I mean, uh, I, I sent back video and uh, from sea during the voyage and photos, and I blogged every day. I, and so when, you, when you're sending back four or five photos a day and, and video, people begin to think that they're really intimate with what you're doing, even though you don't have any idea who they are. And I'd get these comments to me through my wife, just like just like Taylor was saying, you know, what is Randall doing in that photograph where he's not wearing his harness and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the yeah. truth is one of the things that I think, and Taylor, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the things we're, we're in search of out there is is creating a situation where we're reliant on ourselves and can figure out a way to take the, you know, to take the water, to take the air, to take the sea as it comes. And what that means quite oftentimes is not necessarily uh, disregarding the rules or safety procedures, but understanding that they don't always work. They don't always fit. And to Taylor's point, you know, if you, if it's between blowing a head so and capsizing versus getting to the bow without a harness on and you, you learn to take that risk and you learn which risks are are good to take and which aren't i mean on my boat it's quite frankly with really high lifelines and lots of wire going everywhere it's kind of hard to fall off uh, it's been done before but uh it's pretty hard to fall off and i was i was tailored to your point i was uh <laughs> chided for not wearing a life jacket and I, I i tell people you know i'm by myself if i fall over the side wearing a life jacket is really not high on my priorities list. I mean, right. there's no, there's nobody out there to come get me. So what yeah. do I, I buy myself a little, uh, you know, like 20 more minutes of hypothermia 
is really all I get. So, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, it, when you study the, the route and you study the gold and you study the weather and you study the ocean, uh, yeah, it's hugely risky. But after a while, you begin to be familiar with and comfortable with the risks. And it doesn't feel as, I mean, it's still really challenging, but it doesn't feel as challenging as it does to somebody who's just looking at our kind of a cruise from from the outside for the first time. That's a good, yeah. I think you nailed on ahead. I think risk is relative, you know. Yeah, completely. And, and to be fair, you're uh, you're a rescue swimmer, so look, I, I can swim in the ocean water too. I can also overestimate like how far I can go. Like you throw me in any kind of water, I'll swim in it. But mm. at some point, you and I both know like you can bite off too much really fast. You know, like really, the thing you should do is stay on your boat. Is it easy to get overconfident because you are able to hunt and fish and you definitely can swim at a professional level? Is it easy to do that or do you have to check yourself at all? Uh, yeah, definitely. You're, you're on to it there for sure. But like we, you know your limits really well. And that was the thing about rescue swimmer school is like, if I can't swim anymore, I'm getting back in the helicopter because I'm just going to die as well. So um, that, was, that was, I think, the... The best thing about our crew dynamic was John and I had deployed several times together. We knew um, how far we could push and how long. And if it came close to us not being able to push any longer, we'd be like, all right, we're calling it. Um, which we we did. We did end up doing that at one point. Like um, we were we were not supposed to go into the Magellan Strait and down to the Beagle Channel, mm-hmm. but there's a pretty big storm coming, and we had a lot of issues with the boat, and uh, we were pretty freaking exhausted. Uh, at that point so we had a, a real long talk a couple hours below deck in the middle of the storm we we're like we should probably just pull in um because our mission was to finish the documentary and get back and end veteran suicide and if we died out there that wasn't gonna happen um but yeah we, we knew it you know we and we called it so i think the thing is is just knowing your limits really and, and be able to check yourself and say nah i can't do that and that comes with just learning you know you don't know how far you can go until you push yourself out of far before and then it's a matter of luck getting back alive. <laughs> and then you remember that moment and not go that close again. <laughs> I think the other thing people don't realize is uh, there's, there's a, a lot just about where you are that keeps you kind of in check. Because the ocean yeah. down the, you know, below 30 south, the ocean is so big and the winds are so strong and the seas are so tall that it, I found it challenging to get comfortable, as people say. Um, you know, you're, 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 as you know, well, no, you're navigating a, like a, a gale a week and, uh, a regular old gale is fine, but the next one could be a real whopper. And so kind of staying focused is pretty easy to do. I found. That's a good point. Yeah. That's spot on. That's how we were the whole time. I mean, we were on alert. I mean, it's just, the seas are scary down there, man. I mean, they're beautiful, absolutely beautiful, but you're looking at <laughs> on average, like 30, 40 foot seas, which you yeah. don't see up here regularly yeah. you know uh, so down there the entire time like if even the littlest mistake or something that breaks on your boat that's a big deal because yeah. if that compounds yeah the soonest somebody can get to you is a couple of weeks and you guys are all dead um yeah. so so every little decision you made any little thing that happened down there when you're in that environment you're, it's pretty heavy that's interesting you should say that one of my biggest concerns was compounding failure uh not what happens if that breaks right but what happens if that breaks causing two other things to break and suddenly I can't sail and I can't steer and I can't even make a cup of coffee that, that kind of staying on top of the the maintenance and keeping compounding failure in check was, boy, it's really challenging. I mean, uh, you know, I, I had a, a boat that was good, but like you, things fail all the time. And so you, you're having to really walk around the boat and work on the boat and just keep things going. Yeah. The seas are amazing, aren't they? Down yeah. around 30 South, they begin to really stack up and wow. So beautiful, and then with the with the albatrosses flying around, and just right. incredible. And there's some of my most vivid memories are when I come up from the companionway, and I'm looking up, like past the top of the mast, at the top of those rollers coming in, because we were we yeah. were we were running with the waves most of the time on the way down there, and we just look at them rolling in under us. It was just man, was, you don't ever see anything like that anywhere else in the world. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And and crazy that it's kind of that's that's the norm. Tell us about right. your rounding. Is you, uh, you know I figure a Cape Horn approach starts at around thirty degrees south. I know Cape Horn's down at fifty six south, but you get down to thirty thirty five and you're starting to get into the strong westerlies and 
and you know everything is a lee shore at that point when you're coming from the chilly side so what was your what was your approach like what was the actual rounding yeah um so the boat caught fire right before we pulled into uh <laughs> so that's why we so we came back right um, the boat caught fire and we were sinking off of Valparaiso. So we pulled into Valparaiso and then had to come back to the States to, to raise some funds and, and work some jobs to get some more money to put her back together. So we, um, that was during the winter down there, uh, in the summer here. And we came back here for about three months, raised funds, went back down there and, um, to Valdivia. Cause I ended up taking the boat to Valdivia before we left. And we left from Valdivia. And went all the way down to the Magellan Strait. And yeah, so about 30, 38 degrees. Definitely, by definitely 42 degrees south, you're in it, right? Yeah. Like the, the winds were there all the yeah. time, sort of waves. Um, and it was kind of a blessing because we were all well rested, knew what we were getting into by that time. We'd gotten pretty good at it. Um, it wasn't uh, at the risk of sounding, I don't know, cocky that was probably our easiest sail we're like the, in those waves and those winds. Cause the, the whole way down was all, we were in headwinds from Columbia down, man. And that sucked. Mm-hmm. You did not have an, uh, there's not an upwind boat at all. Um, so by the time we were in 40 degrees South, the, the winds in the, in the swell kind of shifted to start catching that current here on Cape Horn. And we were all pretty much downwind, um, the whole way or off or right off the beam. And it was, it was, it was easier. It was a lot easier to go up with though. We were running. Um, and we had a hydro vein at that point. I put in a hydro vein in Ecuador. And, and I mean, that was night and day difference for us. So it was, it was the scariest, but the smoothest sailing we did the whole trip. Explain to people what a hydro vein is. What does, what is that equipment and what does it do? Uh, yeah. So a hydro vein is kind of a, a mechanical autopilot. It doesn't rely on electricity or anything. It's got a, you attach it to the to the back of your boat, and it has a sail on top of it. And you put that sail into wherever the wind's coming from. And then, if this if it gets off course, if the sail on top leans or falls over a little bit, it turns the rudder in the bottom. So, with the winds consistent, you can manage a course and not have to touch the helm. And it gives you time, your body enough time to rest and, and whatnot. But you you probably had some kind of hydro vane or wind vane, didn't you? I had a monitor wind vane, but yeah, monitor. same similar type of technology. And for the same reason, right? You know, hand steering at sea in difficult conditions, even in a boat that's easy to handle, you two, maybe three hours is really all you can do day in, day out. So uh, having some mechanical device to steer the boat is very important. What time of year was this when you were down there? Uh, we, we set sail mid-October. Mm-hmm. So we were, we were through Patagonia in their summer, October, November. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we rounded the horn on New Year's Eve. So tell us what that was like. What uh, what was the weather and what time of day and how did you approach the horn? Um, it was well. We sailed. We got to the horn about midday, um, but I don't know. I don't. Know, so our documentary is out, right? I do a lot of crying before going around the horn because you'll remember this when you're down there. Um, <laughs> I was talking with my grandfather. He was the one that would give us weather updates, right? And on the horizon, I'm watching this like boat breaking like 60 foot 70 foot sea storm coming right at us right and i'm like oh my god we're not gonna get to see it and we're pretty close to shore we're about three miles we're, we should pass within cape horn about three miles right on the shelf there and um so we're like all right we're gonna have to go back out to sea we have to go out to sea about 20 20 miles and, and run with this to get off the shelf before the sea starts building up and um yeah it broke my heart i was bawling like a baby yeah. dude yeah. And that, so that whole morning into the afternoon before we got to Cape Horn, I was a mess. I was just, I was pretty brokenhearted and sad that we weren't going to get to see her. And I was like, we're just going to have to run and see if we stay alive with this storm, you know? Um, but what's funny and what I was talking about earlier was, do you remember when you're down there and those, you see these systems roll in and up here, like in the Gulf, I'm in the Gulf of Mexico now, you see a system like that and you're like, man, that thing's, that thing's going to last like eight days, right? Mm. these massive weather systems <clears throat> but down there dude those these same size systems move in, in like 30 minutes an hour yeah. like it's just powerful it is wild yeah. i've never i've the since i've been back in all the sailing i've done i've never seen these huge systems move that fast yeah um so by the time she got that cell got to us she like just dissipated like went away i was like 
I don't know. It's weird. You have to watch documentaries. We got it on camera, so um, you'll see what I'm talking about. But it was a it was a really weird experience. So most of the day we weren't as happy as people would think. We weren't like, oh, I made it. We're pretty freaking sad. <laughs> Thought we were gonna die. <laughs> so let's 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 pull back a little bit. I think probably a lot of the people listening don't understand what that means. So uh, just as a bit of background, Cape Horn is uh, a, a promontory at the bottom of South America that is the furthest piece of land down into the Southern Ocean. And it's just a point. It's just a, when you get down there, it's just a rock. 56 degrees south, so way, way down there. And the, the nearest other piece of land is to one at one direction, Australia, and in the other direction, uh, South Africa. So you're really in the middle of, of nowhere. You're closer to Antarctica than anywhere else. Yeah. Um, but what what is really challenging is that you're having to weather this, get around, you know, come come from the north, get around and go back up to the north as quickly as you can, but meshing in with these weather systems. And down there, it's all water. There's almost no land down there. So there's like one weather system after the other, and you're having to try to, best you can, time your rounding relative to the storms coming through. And if you get unlucky, as you thought you would be, you know, you're going to have to, to keep yourself safe and, and keep the boat safe. You're going to have to head at, back out to sea, get away as far south of, of Cape Horn as you can and miss that opportunity to see kind of the Everest of sailing. It's, yeah, I, I totally know what you're talking about relative to the emotions. I I didn't think I'd be able to see it either time because of weather coming in. And I, I got lucky, absolutely just balls out lucky that, like you, the weather system that I had been uh, negotiating kind of faded out at the end and I was able to kind of skinny in toward the Cape and see it up close. And it's incredible. It's like, you know, the rock of Gibraltar, but out in the middle of nowhere. And it has this beautiful bald face facing the West. So getting slammed eon after eon by all this weather coming in. It's just incredible to, to see that, to see that rock, just a rock, but boy, what, a, what an amazing rock. <laughs> I want to back up. First off, I want to tell everybody to go to Taylor's website, hellerhighseas.com. You can find out everything about the movie there. You can uh, decide where, what platform you want to watch it on, YouTube, Voodoo, whatever it is. It's all right there, and that's a good spot to go to check that stuff out. Definitely go do that. I want to ask you, as, a, as another, again, uh, fellow combat guy, PTSD guy, um, I don't know that it's always in my best interest to be in a situation. I'm really comfortable with my own death, as, as you probably can uh to relate to Taylor and I, you know, I have suicidal ideation as part of my PTSD. I'm fine. I'm not in danger, but it's easier for me to take bigger risks, life and death risks. I also know because I've got a lot of combat time that sometimes I need to go sleep. You can't just stay up for 72 hours in a row and, and reliably make good decisions. Right. Yeah. But not everybody knows that. And it's easy to lose track of that, especially with us, like guys like who have PTSD and, Maybe you don't care about ourselves enough to really get it right or, or overestimate our capability or underestimate the danger. How do you sort through that stuff, man? How do you deal with all of that? That's awesome. That's a great question. Nobody's asked me that before. Um, it's actually one of my favorite things to talk about on the boat, especially when I sail with crews. And you can ask John and Steven. Um, so sleep was a huge deal on our boat. And I was like Hitler on the sleep. If you're, if you're not on watch, you better go to sleep like right now. Um, you better get some rest because the next storm we get, we could be in it for eight days or seven days. We don't know how long. Um, and if somebody's sleep deprived and not rested and their body can't perform the way it needs to, then every, then all the rest of us will die. You'll make poor decisions. You'll, you'll turn the wrong direction in the wind or pull the wrong line thinking it's the right one just because, I mean, you're pretty much drunk if, you're, if you've been up for four days, three days at a time. Um, your brain just doesn't think that way. So when we sail with veterans, um, it's kind of cool. Everybody knows that limit of theirs. Everybody's operated, stayed awake for two or three days at a time. And that concept isn't, isn't foreign. You know, whenever you start making a bad decision, you're like, I need to slow down. And that was the biggest thing. And I'm sure you can, you can agree to like when you're in the cold down there, your body moves a lot slower. Um, so whenever, if something breaks on your boat, I remember just mentally telling myself over and over again to slow down. Like I had to take things really slow so I didn't mess up. Um, and what would take me, you know, an hour to fix up here in the Gulf down there would take me like three hours because I would make myself go that slow so I didn't make a mistake. Those are all things you just kind of have to be conscious of, which is why I like 
sailing with veterans is cool because everybody gets that. They're like, okay, I know I've been awake and I know my body doesn't respond the way it should for two days. So, um, yeah, you just got to slow down. It's kind of cool. And um, I've had that conversation with, with my other half, Samantha, quite a bit. She, she uh, questions how much risk I take on the boat. Um, she's actually sailed with me quite a bit, too, in the scene. That, and it's, I think it's different once you've been overseas and on deployment in the military. You know what a body can take. It's all about knowing limits, man. That's what it comes down to every time. Um, you know what your body can take. You know what other people's bodies can take. And, I mean, on a physiological level, I know I can get hit and keep working. Or I know how long I can be up and keep working. Um, and it, that's just, it's just explaining that to people. Like, I mean, to you, it looks very risky. But to me, I know I'm not even close to my limit yet. I, I know how, how much longer I can operate and, and how much farther I can push my equipment. It's just, I think it's just, it's just knowing your limits, man. Every time, that's what I, I have to explain to people a lot is you just got to know how far you can go and don't cross that line. Well, and you learn along the way as well. Yeah. Uh, when I started on the first figure eight, I was following the same sleep cycle as I had always done on shorter passages. So I was mm. sleeping for 60 minutes at a time. And I, my deal with myself is I could sleep as many 60 minute increments as I wanted, but never more than 60 minutes and go back on deck, make sure the boat's sailing. All right. And I'm headed down to Cape Horn and I'm, you know, I get into day 50 of this passage and I'm beginning to feel really weird. I mean, I'm sure you had this experience in the military. Like, yeah. you're underslept. You're you're getting to feel fatigue. I'm like, my knees are shaking. I'm seeing things, and I, I don't know what's wrong for a couple of days. I mean, what 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 the heck is going? I'm going crazy. Then I realize, oh, you know what? I'm not getting enough REM. I'm not getting enough sleep. I'm getting plenty of 60 minute cycles, but that's not long enough. So I learned right on a really long passage, something over 30 days, sleeping in 90 minute chunks works for me, and I can kind of do that indefinitely. But I had to make a big adjustment. Uh, headed toward Cape Horn that first time. Yeah, sa sailors figure it out too, real quick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the other thing about us is we're, as opposed to flying, for example, we're going pretty slowly, right? We have time oftentimes to figure out what the screw up was yesterday or the day before and then adjust to things. We're only going six miles an hour or seven miles an hour. It's not like I'm in a 747 and I have 60 seconds to figure out why I'm falling out of the air. But it, you know, it does take staying focused, as you, as you were, as you were saying. That sleep thing too, and learning your limits. I, I know for me, uh, if I come anywhere close to hallucinating, I need to take a break, right? <laughs> and, and that could happen at like twelve hours, depending on how hard, how heavy the load is, right? And and it might be thirty six hours down the road. But I know somewhere in there, no matter what, I'll have to go shut down. You know, in the somewhat near future, not like right then, but. You know, as soon as possible, I need to go get the 90 to two hours, something like that. And then I'll be I'll be recharged enough to press on for again, like you said, Randall, indefinitely. Right. But that does take an amount of, of experience in working and pushing yourself past that point and everything else. I, I mean, did you hallucinate at all when you were on this trip, Taylor, from from fatigue? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know it. I'd see I'd, so I'd have different stages. First, I'll see bugs. I'll see like a beetle or something. I'll see like a bug somewhere. <laughs> Um, next I'll hear like sirens or yeah, things. That's the one um, I get. Yeah. You hear, you'll be out there in the middle. You'll be 800 miles off from here. To right. ambulance. <laughs> like, well, I, I hear people talking, uh, yeah. it's like, uh, dude, I've been alone for like 95 days. Why am I hearing anybody talking? <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I'll know as soon as I start seeing the bugs, it's like, I'm, I'm at my limit. I need to figure out either how to heave to away from shore and rest or, uh, figure change something has to change so i can get rest yeah how are you tracking the weather systems how are you staying on top of weather and what would you do when a big weather system headed your way um so we had a garmin inreach on the boat so we could send messages back to the states and my grandfather would use predict wind mm -hmm. um, based on our lat long and and kind of give us uh, the weather updates um we saw a big storm coming in most of the time we just adjust sales or sail configuration for, cause I mean, you know, you'd have a lot of time. You could see this thing on the horizon uh, to get ready for it. Most of the time we saw it coming in. Um, the only time we drastically adjusted our course for a major storm was when we pulled into the Magellan Strait. And that's mm -hmm. when we just, we just didn't want to risk it um, down there. It was just too big for us. And, uh, but well, the rest of the time out at sea. Where was it coming from? Was it coming from the uh, from the west toward you, or coming up the coast? Coming up the coast from Antarctica. Okay, yeah. 
it had been moving. Yeah. It had been, and I remember that one been building for about a week and a half and, and moving our way. And so we were watching it uh, for about two weeks after that. And, uh, and they came to the point where it was like, it's not getting any smaller. It's gaining yeah. momentum and, and wind speed. And so, yeah, that's when we pulled in. The rest of the time, we, uh, we just adjust our sails on our course. Like, if we were too close to land, if we were in, if we were within land, like Columbia, for instance, we get hit by a storm, we were about 25 nautical miles offshore. And that was just doing math. Uh, if we had to heave to and we were hoped to going toward shore, then we would hit land. So we, we would sail out further to sea to give us room to run if we hope to. Um, so those kind of decisions happen based on storms, but not not really altering our course. Mm-hmm. Um, but that it kind of brings me to another thing. Um, we were talking about sleep and stuff, and Randall, I kind of wanted your your opinion on this. I used uh, I used a drogue for the first time mm. uh, before we pulled into Chile, and uh, that was I think my biggest mistake and and worst thing I have ever done on that entire trip, dude. For real. And it, cause it just, because like it, it worked, right. It worked in the storm and it slowed us down drastically, but it took me about eight and a half hours to get that thing back on the boat. And by the time I got on the boat, <laughs> I was cashed, dude. If we got hit by another storm, I would have died because I could yeah. not have even pulled another line at all. And I'll, yeah. I'll never do that again. Or I'll, just, maybe I'll bring one and cut it if I need to, but I'll never. It, that is again. the most challenging thing about drugs. So just what is a drug? A drogue, uh, imagine a parachute uh, that's, you know, six six feet across. And this would just be one style. I don't know what style you use. But for people who don't know, a, a drogue is a storm survival tool. It's a way of slowing the boat down and keeping the boat oriented a particular direction toward the seas by throwing out what we call a drag device, a drogue. It slows the boat down. Think of a parachute dragging in the water behind the boat. And it keeps the boat safe. But boy, you you hit the nail on the head there. It's it's really challenging. Uh, it's one of the reasons that we over and over again deploy the drug too late is because it's so challenging to get it back in. Uh, you must have had a pretty stiff wind when you were trying to haul it in. You just winch it. You just went tried to winch it in. Yeah, I was still. Whenever that storm died, I was right before I pulled into Valdivia, and the wind was still about forty five <laughs> knots on the average. Um, that was that sucked. Wow. That's yeah. my worst experience. <laughs> Sailing. No, I, I, so I don't know. Okay, what kind of a drug did you have? I honestly don't. It came with a boat when I bought okay. it. It's this old yellow, huge parachute. And yeah. it, but it did have one of those collapsible lines you could pull that would collapse it in the water, um, which it did collapse. It was just, it's still this huge parachute you're pulling into the boat. <laughs> yeah, I have two. I have one like that and another one called the Jordan Series drug, which is a bunch of tiny parachutes on a piece of line about 300 feet long. So like 150 tiny parachutes, same idea. This particular drogue actually tries to stop the boat cold in the water, to essentially anchor in the sea. And I have to wait till the wind is down to 20, 25 knots. Otherwise I can't, I just can't haul it in. So to your point, you talked about uh, hitting some bad weather on a lee shore. Yeah, you know, if you throw out a, 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 a drogue and you're only a couple hundred miles offshore and the wind is blowing you toward shore, Boy, you got to hope that whatever's hit you really hard passes over and the wind calms down. Otherwise, you're just going to drag yourself right onto the beach. So that's, yeah. It's challenging. I, I used both. I had two, a slowing drug and a stopping drug. I used both of them probably two or three times. I tried to sail through most everything because I was on a schedule. I had to make the miles. I had to get around mm-hmm. the Southern Ocean in time yeah. to get up the Atlantic in time to get into the Arctic in time to get home. And meshing all of those timings together was a challenge. So I tried to sail through most of the bad stuff, but I, I did use the drug a couple of times, and uh, they're beautiful. They they do the job, but yeah, they're difficult to retrieve. the The only trick that I learned was to start the engine and slowly back down mm. to try to stop the boat. So you're just hauling in on the drogue as opposed to hauling the drogue in as the boat is making way. Um, but yeah, they're, they're challenging. So it sounds like how many times did you use that? You sailed through most once. every, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Once. Yeah. One enough, huh? And since then, <laughs> yep. One and done, man. I was, that was just, it put me in such a, I was scared, like legitimately scared. Um, the only time, other time I'd been scared like that is when we put the mass in the water, when we were entering and down straight, we were in about 75 foot seas and uh, we got hit by one wave. John and I were on the bow trying to get our jib in and, uh, yeah, put our mass in water, rolled us. Um, 
that was the only other time I was scared like that. I was so terrified after I got that drove in because I knew if I get hit by another storm, I was dead. I couldn't do anything. I wasn't, I was going to be worthless. Um, and I was just going to take it. Thank God we didn't get hit by another storm after that. Um, so I haven't touched it in. And since then my storm tactics, every time I'm either running with the storm or I'm heaving too, man. And it's, that's been comfortable and, and done more well every time. Yeah. How long did it take you to recover from that drone, a uh, drogue hauling? I mean, I, it's, you know, at some point you've had enough calories, and everything back in your system, but how long did that take? So by the time when I got the drogue in, I was like so about 20 miles away from Valdivia at that point. I was supposed to pull into Valdivia um, three days prior, but that storm hit me and I had to go back out to see. I could see land. I could see the entrance of the, of the river to go to Valdivia. And that storm came in and I wasn't about to make that approach. I still had um, at least five hours to go. And by that time, the storm would have been on me and I probably would have put the put the boat on the beach. So I had to turn and go back out to sea. And then about halfway in that storm, I, I ended up putting the drogue out. So um, by the time that storm left, um, I was back. I was about 20 miles back closer to shore because I hoped to. And... I made it into land about six hours in Valdivia, and I slept for a day and a half after that. So Steve <laughs> Harris, the guy we keep talking about, he was already there, and um, he was waiting for me. He knew they were uh, they were at shore watching the storm roll in. They thought I was dead because they couldn't talk to me, and um, they saw me roll in the next day. And I didn't have any power on the boat or anything, so they didn't know that I made it. And um, he saw the the old lady in my boat roll in, and he was waiting at the dock with a warm beer. Yeah. He's like, dude, we all thought you died. <laughs> um, but he gave me a warm beer and he helped me tie up the boat. And I went to sleep for a day and a half. He didn't, he didn't come knock on the boat or anything. Nobody came to check on me because they knew I was just exhausted. Um, yeah, I, I was out. That feeling of having been in a situation where you're not entirely sure you'll figure it out. You're not entirely sure you'll come out the other side of it. That feeling you have when you finally get in somewhere and are anchored or tied up and you're down below and the boat's no longer throwing you from side to side and, you know, you can crawl in a sleeping bag and actually be in a sleeping bag long enough to get warm. Like, that is just the most delicious time. Man. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, I, I, what, Cape Horn, I mean, you could have done anything, right? Could have gone anywhere. There are all kinds of physical tests to be had, what was it about Cape Horn that attracted you uh, relative to this goal of highlighting veteran suicide? Yeah. Um, when I got out, I wanted to sail around the trade winds, man. I wanted to sail around the world, you know, <laughs> like everybody does. Um, but by, by this time, a lot of my buddies killed themselves and I had a really hard time. Um, I talk about that all in the documentary and it's on our website. And uh, so we, Steven and I, Steven's the guy that helped me out a lot going through my challenges coming back to the States. And so we got together and we were like, well, let's talk about your experience getting out and um, how your body's changed and how you live with it. So maybe the guys coming out after us won't go through what we did. And we were like, well, what's, what's one thing people will pay attention to? And it's not sailing around the islands, you know, because we don't have bikinis on our boat. Nobody's going to watch right. that. <laughs> uh, so we're like, well, the only other thing we could do in the world that's bad enough is, is Cape Horn. And which, you know, I mean, it's just, it's the Mount Everest of the seas. And I don't even think that's fair because so many people climb Mount Everest. I mean, right. Cape yeah. Horn is another, is times right. 10, another beast. So right. um, that answer kind of made itself like, well, we have to sail around Cape Horn if anybody is going to pay attention to what we're talking about. Um, so that, yeah, that's how Cape Horn came about. It was just the baddest thing we could think of in the world that was on the water. And that's where the goal, the goal came about. Had you done sailing before or was this, uh, kind of virgin territory for you i mean nothing nothing like that uh -huh. at all uh i learned to sail in the navy whenever i was stationed in san diego mm -hmm. uh, when i first got in the navy and then whenever i was stationed in guam i'd keep sailing um the navy has a cool mwr program where you can rent sailboats for pretty cheap so um when we were stationed in japan they had a really cool little sailboats there i go sail around there and then australia I did a lot of sailing um so i i, I was familiar with like cruising you know but not high latitude sailing no way man i didn't know i'd never seen storms like that before um, no i that was all we all learned that on the way yeah so what about you uh, no, I'm, I'm asking, no no i'm asking you questions <laughs> i'm not done um 
So uh, y- 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 this is all in the context of PTSD, right? And, and you're, you're wanting to kind of shine the light on, on veteran suicide relative to PTSD. But you've done that by taking yourself from a war zone, super stressful and traumatic, to uh, a, a sailboat that's kind of fallen apart headed toward the worst ocean in the world and the pinnacle of sailing, which is just getting around Cape Horn, which is going to be somewhat traumatic and stressful. So uh, how was, how would you, how did you handle the stress of being at sea versus the stress of being in the military in, in a, in a hot zone? Um, so I was never in a war zone. I was a rescue swimmer and I was stationed in Guam with the agency 25 and, and the things I saw weren't, weren't, you know, people getting blown up. It was people drowning and boats sinking and stuff. And we pretty much acted like an ambulance. Uh, you know, you pick up people on their on their worst day and take them to a hospital and hope they live. Um, that's what I saw and lived with. So sailing, I guess, to start from the beginning, the concept is, is kind of naive and, and I think really oversimplified, but I think it still holds true today. Um, the thing with PTSD is there's a direct correlation between adrenaline and memory recall, right? So whenever you, you have your hands on somebody that's, that's going to die, right. Or been torn up by coral reef or, or been blown up for guys that went overseas to Iraq, Afghanistan, um, your adrenaline's pumping. So that moment is seared in your brain. Um, you see it and you can pull, you can pull those memories and still see it as clear as you could back then, every time. And my thinking was my problem is I see this, that's all I see now, right? Um, when I got back and um, I would still sail and I knew how I was when I was sailing and that was kind of like the only thing I held on to is like, this is the only thing really so beautiful where I would see that the world would, would be beautiful again. And so my, my thinking was, if adrenaline plays that much of a role in your memory recall, what if you just piled adrenaline filled beautiful memories in people's minds instead uh, of adrenaline filled terrible dark moments? Man. Yeah. Um, and I, dude, and, and this is, this is no bullshit for real. So I still have a lot of problems today. I'll still have my, my, my dark days, but dude, now I can pull on those memories of sailing through Patagonia over the sunrise, dude, and wow. penguins and whales around our boat. And I'm like, this world is beautiful. It can be beautiful. You have to go find it and see it. Um, so whenever you get veterans with PTSD on the boat and their adrenaline is running and you're seeing the most beautiful thing you've seen in the world that stays with you. And that reminds you when you're in that dark moment, like that this world is, is pretty, is worth it to live. Wow. In. That's beautifully um, said. Beautifully so said. That, I hope that answers kind of why. Well, uh, I, I, I get that why a lot too. You know, like when I started adventure sailing, uh, when I first started talking about the figure eight voyage, uh, people would ask me why, and I wouldn't really understand. I mean, like if you had the opportunity to go sail around Cape Horn, you know, spend 120 days at sea and do this amazing thing, wouldn't you? And I thought, well, anybody would. Uh, and as a matter of fact, that's not true. You know, not everybody <laughs> is looking forward to being cold and uh, tired and wearing the same clothes for three months. Uh, it just isn't everybody's cup of tea. But to your point, the beauty of the day in, day out, wild nature that we get to see out there is just stunning and and uh yeah that's I, I, your description is beautiful thank you and I, I think you're right about that too i mean obviously you know i suffer from it actually uh, and this is not meant to bring the show down my brother who's a veteran he committed suicide or died by suicide is what we're supposed to say now um about a month ago and you know it, it came decades after his service but it just was an accumulation of things and he just ran out of the ability to stay mentally well so, you know, this is not just like a one time like, hey, I'm going to go sailing with Taylor and be healed like like you. Right. I mean, every day I'm not in danger right now, but every day I have suicidal ideation and I have to persevere through it. And I've built things into my life to reduce, like to deflate the deflate the balloon, but also things to put those good memories in. Like I like to go out on the road and do a road trip and interact with people because it turns out that people and our nation, it's like my own like land based version of sailing. Right. It's incredible. You go drive through New Mexico and you meet people that are just fascinating and wonderful. You, you realize that there are a lot of good things and, and it, is, uh, it is a good service that you're doing. Um, and I know it, that kind of thing has helped me for sure as, as we all try to sort through this stuff. So 
<sighs> what um what do you do with the veterans that come through and need more help i mean do, i mean I, you ha- you do what you do right but some people need more attention they need more case management what do you do to to get them to that next step that next cuz you know we're all a bunch of assholes too and we don't want to actually take the help that's available right we want to yeah. we want to tough it through and uh, that's what kills a lot of us yeah well, man, I'm I'm sorry to hear about your brother, dude. I know how much that hurts, and uh, yeah, and it sucks because I I work in a veteran uh, suicide prevention charity. You know, it's like right, boom, right next to me. You know, it's horrible. Yeah, I get that completely. Um, like you said, one of the things we talked about. When, so I run a nonprofit now with uh, my buddy Cameron. It's called American Odysseus Sailing Foundation, um, and we see that a lot. And one of our big things, uh, along with the documentary, we talk about this in the documentary is 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 it educating like it, it doesn't go away and it's not you have to shift your thinking to to not suffering from ptsd but living with ptsd it's not going to go away um you need to find out how your body responds what your limit is man it all comes back to limits like when you're at that limit um just like here at my house samantha knows when i'm there i gotta go sail i gotta go sail for a couple of days and get my head right and see the world and be a part of it again um uh, and so we talk about that when we sail a lot of the guys that we sail are repeat dudes that have sailed with us before and they come out and come back and get on a sail with us. Um, so it, it's, it's all how you manage your own body. When you get to that limit, you know, you need to do something different. And it's not sailing for everyone. Like you said, a lot of people go hiking, camping is a big one, kayaking and fishing. Um, there's a lot of adventure therapy programs popping up around the country for veterans with PTSD. Um, not because they want to, but because it works and because they need to, because it actually helps people. And, and they're not going to go away because it, it's a consistent thing. People are going to need to constantly be out there in the world, get their body moving and get their adrenaline going in a healthy environment to live a healthy life. Um, and that's something I think we need to really start bringing to active military guys when we come back from performance. You know, I think that's the goal. It's kind of a stepping stone for the film to kind of wake people up and start making moves that direction. This is the this is that important thing, too, because you and I both say PTSD. I know it's also in vogue to say PTS, but but. I believe in the D part of it. Like this is something that until further notice, I'm going to have this, you know, I, I can, I can manage it today, you know, but things could quickly get out of hand. And, and I, I look, I'm not any tougher than any of my peers in the military, you know, yeah. someone else was in this spot and got further down the road and I'm trying like hell not to do that. Um, but the, I just don't see it going away for me. You know, I'm going to, I work on it. I have therapy all the time. I spend a lot of time trying to be alive and some of us don't understand that we're obsessed about some other thing or whatever, you know, they, we've got a dead end job that we have to go to because we can't afford not to have it. And yet you're like, yeah, but it's, it's killing you. You know, we, we've got to get guys to get out on the boat more often. And I think also being in a service of other people is another area where you go out and you're helping bring folks back from the edge or just providing an opportunity for fellowship. It just pays such good dividends for your soul that, it's therapeutic in and of itself. Yeah, uh, there's a couple couple things to unpack there. The first one, I I don't bringing guys out. I think is 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 a is a mission for me, um, and I like helping guys. I, I want to make sure my buddies don't kill themselves. It's it's, it's work. I still have to go sail on my own um, and get out there and, and just be a part of it. Um, the biggest thing that, that clicked for me was when I first got back, I was, I was determined to be the healthy person I was before the military and I, and I didn't have an issue. Right. And I was like, I didn't, this isn't me. PTSD isn't a part of me. It's not going to define who I am. Um, I want nothing to do with it. And then what clicked probably about halfway through the expedition was, I was like, it's not going anywhere. You know, now I need to like, this is who I am. This is how my body is now. And I need to live with it and I need to figure out how to do that. And, uh, yeah, that's sailing um, for me. But sailing guys around is awesome. Dude, getting guys on the water is great, but it's also heart heartbreaking at the same time because guys, all the stories I hear of guys trying to go to the VA and get help and it's not happening for all the guys that have been living with this by themselves for so many years, for decades, dude, especially when we go to screenings and guys from Vietnam will come up and say, I've been living with this by myself. And nobody's ever talked about this. And I haven't talked about it to anyone. I'm like, dude, how much pain have you lived in for decades by yourself like that breaks your heart and pisses me off um so that our sales like 
it's left me pretty jaded, man. I, I get I get real pissed on how how guys are taken care of and, and how little they know about how to take care of themselves when they come back to the states. Because I mean, we're the United States, dude. We shouldn't have this issue. We should take care of guys when they come home. Um, but the uh, the light of that is when we do these things and we sail with these people. Like there are communities that give a shit and want to help and and create these programs to get guys on the water, make sure we're not killing ourselves. Um, that's cool, but. There's there's a lot we could do to help, and there's a lot of guys out there that are still hurting and, and silent, you know, and they don't need to not anymore, not this day and age. I was really I was, yeah. go ahead, sorry, man. So, thanks, sorry. I So I'm I'm not a military guy, and so I find this discussion this part of the discussion fascinating. I was actually really taken aback by the statistic in your press release that uh, some thirty thousand active duty personnel post 9-11 have died by suicide compared to 7,000 in active duty. That's, you know, so I read the Wall Street Journal and I try to stay on top of things, but I had no idea that you were dealing with this kind of death and that kind of an epidemic uh, uh, level. How do you get, you know, so congratulations to you for the, for the movie and, and trying to get the word out, but how are you going to keep doing this? Uh, I mean, we're not going to stop no matter what happens. I guess that's the easiest way to, to answer that question. I don't really care about how and we make it work, no matter what the means are to keep getting guys on the water and keep pushing and talking to people about PTSD. Um, yeah, the other part of that statistic is, is more people have died by suicide than people um, that actually died in war, dude. And that's yeah. if that doesn't wake people up and slap somebody in the face, like we have a problem here. Um, but I don't know what will, and, and it's just, it needs to change. That's part of the thing with the documentaries is to kind of wake up people that, that make our laws and our policy. Um, so if there's other programs in other countries that exist today, the UK and the Israeli defense force specifically. Um, and it's not uncommon to think this way because we do it with flying. So flying, like we're talking about rest, right? If you fly for X amount of hours, you have X amount of hours rest and recovery because there's so much research compiled and documented that, if you've extended your body, you're not going to make good decisions in the aircraft and you're going to kill everyone. Well, the same concept goes to if you've extended your body over a nine month or 12 month deployment or 13 month deployment, are you healthy enough to make those good decisions and operate where you could be sure you can, you're 80% there? Fine. Like I, we did that for years. So you can operate, you can do it, but you're not your best. You're tired, man. So the concept is, is crew rest. Like we're flying. You get 12 hours, you're down for eight or six hours. So if you go on a nine, 12 month deployment, you should be down for three weeks. You should give your body and your mind time to heal. I mean, that's, and that's not a stretch to ask. And that's, there's a lot of research to back that up. Um, we just need to do it here in the States. Other countries are doing it. We're just, we're behind, man. And, and I think it takes this documentary and media and podcasts to, to kind of wake people up and, and know that there is a solution. It's not a far stretch to ask and we just have to implement it. One of the uh, things that, uh, led to my brother's demise was a lack of the ability to sleep and turn his brain off, you know, and, and this is something that we, again, that, look, I want to be critical of the VA too, but I also want to give them credit. They're adapting as fast as they're able. They're not a little right. tiny sailboat that can just go towards leeward or, or, you know, exactly. they, they can't. Yeah. but they're even embracing MDMA, psilocybin treatments, all these other things. So, so they are working on it. And one of them mm -hmm. is uh, have the ability to, to put our hands on the sleep problem and really mm -hmm. get after it, you know, but, it's so hard because we all start with this veterans and you probably didn't realize this, Randall, but when we look at an institution like the VA or trying to get a job somewhere where we're qualified to work, we already put one or two strikes against them so that the moment that we are ready for them to fail us. And so that the moment that there is a barrier, like that's failure and they don't care about me. And it's, it's just not true. Right. True. Yes. Yeah. The VA is a pain in the ass and you have to have an advocate and you have to have a guide and you have to sometimes switch guides. But there are people there that are desperate. I mean, during COVID, and I would talk to the people, the VA that I deal with, they're all just emotionally wrecked yeah. as people are just dying left and right. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Because, you know, the VA is just, it's not full of healthy people <laughs> for the most part. I mean, it's its pretty rough, right? Because the older folks, they get in there and and they suffer. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that the, I want to be I want to be hard on the VA because we can expect better from them. But we also have to understand just how far they've come. And, uh, and it's these things like understanding... Mental problems are not easy to identify. And I would say if you could see it externally as a wound on my shoulder, 
he wouldn't expect me to work. He'd be like, stop what you're doing. You need to recover. Let's focus on getting you right. And if that's going to a sleep school for two weeks, then that is what you do. And as a nation, we've asked you to do something and we've broken you in the process. Let's, let's get these guys right. If it's something as, and I'll say simple as sleep or direct as sleep, we should be able to handle that as an institution, getting folks the rest they need so they don't get worse with their mental illness. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, and it's not a slight to the VA. Like you said, of course, uh, every, of course. the people that work there are, are incredible, amazing. Yeah. But, dude, they're swamped. There's 20 million yeah. veterans in the United States. <laughs> so much them. work, yeah. We can't depend on them and fault them, the people that work there. You know, the VA is, it, like you said, great. It's great, but they're they're overwhelmed. There's 20 million people. Yeah, and by the way, if you're a veteran and you get struggle and you're at the VA and, and you're getting spun around, just say these words. I'd like to go see the patient advocate. And that like pulls the screen up and the person at the VA is like, oh my God, that's right. You're the important person here because sometimes the institution gets moving faster than the patient can move. And those magic words, We'll get that person to either correct or they'll guide you to the patient advocate and the patient advocate will, will then draw attention back to that section and try to get whatever it fixed. But sometimes it just takes that, that mental check-in with the person who's helping you and gets them to slow down like you on the boat, right? Like, Oh, let me slow way down here and go half speed. Cause I've got to get, I've got to deal with this person, this problem I haven't recognized. So anyhow, yeah, that's just my soapbox and, and talking to veterans specifically. I'd like to go see the patient advocate. That will help you. All right. Uh, I want to let uh, Randall and you guys have some chance to close out and uh, do your final words. <laughs> Randall, are you going back to Antarctica? Um, I'd like to. I think m- more likely is a return to the north. Uh, COVID kind of shut everything down, as you know. Couldn't go to another country for the longest time. Canada, I believe, is open, but I'm not entirely sure. I think what I'd like to do is, is freeze in for a winter up in the Arctic somewhere. Just experience that part of the world where it gets dark all the time uh, and where there's uh, ice everywhere. But that's a big, big order. So I, I think the, the short term plan for me is to take the boat up into Alaska next summer and to spend a winter in like medium latitude Alaska, Prince William Sound, home or something like that, where it gets plenty dark and cold, but it doesn't freeze in and I can actually get my ass out of there if I, if I need to. <laughs> so just by way of practice. <laughs> That's my plan. How about yours? Um, yeah, I mean, my end game is to run American Odysseus sailing out of out of Patagonia. I want guys. I want to be able to fly guys down there and see what we saw. Yeah, um, I think just that memory will stay with the rest of life. I think it'll keep people alive. So, yeah, yeah my end game is absolutely to be in Patagonia and, and operate sail veterans out of there consistently. Ah, yeah, very good. That's exciting. Very exciting. I don't know the how, but one day. <laughs> <I will. laughs>